Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for that little bit of delay and um, being patient with us. My name is Meg Boyer, and I serve as the product marketing manager for the newest addition to McGraw-Hill Education's suite of personalized learning products, Redbird Language Arts and Writing. But today, I'm here to welcome you to an hour of what we hope will be an engaging professional learning experience as we learn from two great minds in the field of personalized learning and adaptive technology. I'd like to first introduce you to Janet Pittock, Curriculum Director here at McGraw-Hill Education. With roots in elementary classrooms, Janet Pittock has a deep personal commitment to personalized technology solutions that inspire and engage each student. Janet's taught elementary school, preschool, special ed, and Algebra I. She's, an act, she's active in national math organizations, volunteering on the board of NCSM as the editor of the monograph series, serving on the editorial board of NCTM's yearbook on algebra, and leading the TOTOS webinar task force. She's developed many math materials, including McGraw-Hill's own Redbird Mathematics. Next up, we'll hear from Dr. Dan Flickinger, Senior Research Associate at Stanford University. Dr. Flickinger is an internationally recognized computational linguist at Stanford Center for the Study of Language and Information where he's been developing practical computational models of language for the past 20 years. It's described in, his work is described, has been described in more than 70 research publications. His technology for analyzing the English language is in use at research centers around the world for applications ranging from machine translation to information retrieval. In 2009, he joined Stanford's education program for gifted and talented youth team adapting his writing and language analysis technology to provide precise and robust analysis of sentence and paragraph composition for what is now Redbird Language Arts and Writing. Now, when I came to the Redbird team just a little over a year ago, I, perhaps like some of you with us today, considered myself a novice in the areas of blended learning and personalized learning in particular, um, and even in many respects in the area of adaptive technology. But over the last year, I have been lucky enough to have both Janet and Dan as teachers about why student-centered adaptive technology can be such a powerful tool in the ELA classroom and how it can be most powerfully implemented. I'm so excited to share these great teachers with you today. Janet Pittock. Good morning or good afternoon, that is. Um, <laughs> I um, first like to start by looking at some of the tools that you have so that you can communicate with us. There's two panels on your screen that you can use to, um, to communicate with us. The first one is the one that's got a little QA um, icon. That is where you'll put questions that you would like us to answer, um, either questions about the slide that we're working on or questions for the end of the session when we have our Q&A session. The other place is, is this little chat box where you can chat with each other as things go on and you can respond to any questions we might ask you along the way. And in fact, the first question is right here. Um, we have a writing epidemic today. And how many out of four students at both grade eight and 12 lack proficiency in writing? So if you would enter into that chat box, how many, what number, one, two, three, or four, zero, um, out of four students you think lack proficiency in writing. And I'll wait for a few people to enter their answers. This will help me know that you know where that box is. Okay, we've got, we've got, a, we've got some answers, thank you. And most of you are right. Three out of four students at those grade levels lack proficiency in writing. That's definitely an issue. So let's look at the next question. Out of, of 12th graders, how many out of five students fall below basic in writing? This is the lowest quartile of students or the lowest group of students. How many students out of five fall below basic in writing? Again, answer, enter your answer zero through five in that chat box. This is, these are the worst performing students. How many out of five? 
All right, the news is better than most of you are guessing. 20% of our students are below basic in writing. So, so if you we look at the combination of the first and second um, questions, 75% of students are not proficient, but of those, but but out of all of our students, only 20% are in are are in the worst possible shape. So we have some, we have, we definitely have room to, to grow, um, but it's not quite as bad as you all are guessing. So that's that's good. And the final the final question is at the average fourth grader spends fewer than how many hours per week writing? Please enter your, your guess here. The average fourth grader spends fewer than how many hours per week writing? We know that they have to practice. Are they getting enough practice? You all are, so far, folks are guessing that they aren't getting enough time practicing. The news, again, is better than you're guessing. Students are spending fewer than three hours. It's still not enough for them to be proficient. So um, as you all are guessing um, and, and attesting to, we have a writing epidemic in American schools these days. So today, what we're gonna be talking about is how can educators improve the statistics we were just talking about? That's what I'll be talking about. Then Dan will take over to talk about what does research say and what, is, what kinds of things has he developed that can help. Then Meg will lead the question time. So remember, in that little Q&A space, please enter your questions for us to answer as they come up as you go so that Meg has some questions to ask us at the end. And then we'll talk about what your next action steps might be as you engage in thinking about personalized instruction in your literacy classroom. All right, so improving the stats. Teachers say, I only have a sliver of instructional time to focus on grammar and writing with my students. How do I spend it? How can technology help? I mean, these are big, big questions for, um, for teachers. So what we know is that keeping students in their zone of proximal development is really important. So let's look at this slide for a second. You can see along the bottom axes, that's the level of proficiency. So they're not very proficient in the material that they're learning or, or they've really got it. The, the vertical axis is about the level of difficulty. So it's really easy for the student or you know, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. So the zone of proximal development is when those are balanced. If, if the student is very proficient, so under, under the blue arrow it is where, when the student is really is getting it and the challenge is not enough for them, they get bored, they become apathetic, you lose them. So this is not a good space for a student to be working in. Above the arrow is where the student doesn't have, isn't that proficient with the material and it's quite challenging. At this point, they become anxious they're beginning to feel like there's nothing, no matter what they do, they can't, be, they can't be successful. And this is also not a place you want students to get. It's actually um, prevents them from building that idea that, that um, if they work hard, they can improve. So that idea of growth, growth mindset, if the students are up here in this uh, above the arrow area, um, there, that's working against them developing that that idea of growth um, growth mindset. All right, so uh, let's just check something here. Yeah, I skipped it. I skipped a slide. All right, so another, the next question is the next thing that you can do to improve the stats is you can give students immediate feedback. We know that's really important. So we consider this screen here. You've got a teacher who's working with a group of four students. Potentially, they, she's giving this one student or maybe the group of students immediate feedback on what they're working on. But what's going on with the rest of the students? They're working on stuff. They're not getting immediate feedback. They may be, they may be practicing something incorrectly and reinforcing bad habits. Um, they may be doing, we don't know what they're doing. So how can a teacher give immediate feedback? And certainly with writing, this is a huge problem. Um, as, as students are writing, the, a whole class of students is writing, the best the teacher could do is collect those papers and give them feedback later that day is probably the soonest it could happen. Um, a teacher can sit next to a student and review their material and give that one student immediate feedback, but it's not physically possible for an individual teacher 
to be giving students immediate feedback. This is where technology can be very helpful in certain things. So let's talk about what kinds of things are, are, is technology good at? Technology is good at providing patient practice. So by that I mean um, there's been research that shows that, that teachers get bored with practice more quickly than students do. And often teachers will move students to the next thing before, before the student is ready. And again, this depends on where the student is in their zone of proximal development and not all your students are in the same place. So when you're working with a whole class, you're gonna move students on um, before they're ready or after they're bored. Um, and it will only be right on for a certain specific. But technology can practice with the students as long as they need to or move them on to the next thing when they're ready, as soon as they're ready to move on. So technology is good at that, better at doing that for each individual student than a teacher working with whole class can be. Um, technology is also good at assessing, assessing things that are clearly right or wrong. So if there's one or a few correct answers, technology can say, yep, the students got it, or, or no, they don't. So tech is really good at that and can, and can give information about whether something is right or wrong and why it is right or wrong, and maybe even a hint about how to get it right if it is wrong um, immediately. So that immediate feedback is something that technology can give as soon as students put their answer into the machine. And the, another thing that technology is really good at is assigning an X item based on the level of proficiency. So what are teachers good at? Well, teachers are good at a lot of those same things, but not immediately for 30 students at the same time. But teachers are super good at relationships, interactions, input on nuanced work. These are things that technology can't do. And we know that relationships and the kinds of interactions that can happen where a teacher coaches a student to learn how to learn, those are things that are, have huge, huge impacts on students. They're things that teachers often, when they're teaching a whole class lesson and grading tons of papers and grammar papers, don't have as much time to do. So how do we provide time for teachers to maximize their time in the art of guiding learning, allowing technology to handle the science of learning? Well, we can use some of these, some of these implementation models, which, which free up teachers from being the one to provide all of the instruction and to and that free teachers up from being the one to provide all of the interaction with the students. So there are three here that, um, that I'll talk about very briefly. The first one on the upper left is the menu, is a, is a menu model where the teacher would cre can create um, a series of, of activities or experiences that students can do, including small group including small, um, different kinds of, of, small, of collaborations between students and including adaptive software, or some kind of technology. And the teacher can allow students to make choices. If you don't have a one-to-one -one in your classroom with computers, they can make choices and, and rotate on and off of the computers. So this is one way that by giving students a variety of activities they can do, teachers can also have time to meet with small groups or individual students to do some of those relationship things and to give more nuanced feedback on writing um, than software might be able to. Um, up here in the upper right, this is a very familiar, that represents a very familiar uh, uh, classroom organization, which is, which is rotations, where the teacher has some time with the whole class and then splits students into different stations, allowing to, them to rotate. One thing, and so that you could have a you could have an, uh, uh, an adaptive software station or a computer station. You could have, you could have small group instruction. You could have individual um, assignments um, that students could be doing. You could be having students rotate. This can give you the opportunity in that small group portion to meet one-on-one -on -one with students or with small groups of students in order to build those relationships, help them understand how to make good learning choices, and to give them feedback on on structure and um, tone and other things about writing. And finally, the bottom one is a one-to-one -one, um, student to computer ratio uh, situation, which can happen if you have one-to-one -one in your school or can be provided through a computer lab or, um, uh, or, or a set of computers that come to your, your classroom.
Um, and I think you know it's clear how that will allow teacher to, as all the if all the students are working on excellent software, the teacher can also um, have time to um, work pull students out one on oneers in small groups. Okay. So I've been talking about, I've just finished talking about how, how educators can improve statistics. Now Dan is going to start speaking about what does the research say and how, um, and, and what kinds of things he's built that are supported by research. Yeah, thanks Janet. Um, I want to take you through uh, a um, little bit of history about the development of this uh, technology that we're using for writing instruction uh, and uh, see if I can overcome some of your uh, plausible and initial skepticism about how effectively uh, software can be um, exploited or have a role in this uh, instructional task, uh, working with students who are learning how to write and improve their writing skills. The uh, uh, implementation that we're working with is in this Redbird Language Arts and Writing uh, curriculum and includes a focus on um, uh, elements that are important for the students and also elements that are important for the, uh, for the instructor who's keeping track of um, this student work, which is largely independent and, and uh, driven by the students' needs and by their own uh, pace of instruction, their own pace of learning. So the roots for this work go quite a ways. Uh, uh, I've been working at Stanford on technology that is uh, um, under, underneath, that's inside of this evaluation component for react to the sentences and short paragraphs that students write. Um, and I'll say a little bit about that in a moment as I explain how we're using that technology. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that we have been working at Stanford with a group um, headed by uh, Patrick Supis. Um, whose picture you'll see there. Uh, mine is should be in smaller uh, frame, since uh, Patrick Supis was a giant in this field. Developed uh, 50 years ago, the notion of using computers um, in active instruction, to have the machine sensitive to what students can they learning uh, and giving new instruction. I'm hoping that the audio is keeping up with you here. There's a little bit of instruction that it's uh, an indication that it's a little bit. Maybe if I talk a little more slowly, uh, we can survive that technological um, obstacle. The the program content in this course is um, focused on these three big components, which you would expect in language. There is a language component that involves grammar, mechanics, vocabulary. There is a component of uh, because we want to give the students um, good models for what what uh, writing looks like and how it works. Um, the uh, the the middle component, that writing component, the one I want to focus on primarily here, um, and that writing component involves um, some uh, multiple choice, some basic instruction, but also um, a, a crucial component where the student actually writes sentences given prompts of the right sort and uh, gives the student feedback, error-specific feedback about the kind of um, mistakes that they have made and how they can make an improvement. So let me give you a couple of examples of that. In this uh, instruction, there is on, the, on that upper left box, there is a kind of long uh, paragraph, uh, several sentences, and then a request for the student in this kind of multiple choice mode. Um, in the lower box, there's a more interesting kind of exercise, which is at the heart of the work uh, in this language arts and course, where the student is given a short prompt, um, asked a question, and then invited to construct a sentence out of, in this case, a very small vocabulary of candidate uh, words that they're supposed to use um, from the basic parts of speech. So here we're not asking the student to do a lot of thinking about what they should say, but to focus on how they're saying it. And so we can identify some typical mistakes the students make um, and, and give responses on how to fix that. Just as a reminder, before I go into a little of those examples about how the writing is done, how the evaluation and feedback is done, I want to remind you that this course includes a fair amount of supplemental instruction on these core concepts, core elements that are part of standard curricula for language arts and writing. 
And so here you see a snap from one of the video lectures that we include. There's a typically a couple of minutes in time um, and uh, give the student a reminder about material that they should have been learning and that they've probably been learning from you, the teachers uh, in classroom instruction. But where we bring it to the foreground, student has that readily in mind as they work on the tasks that we present for them within this online course. So here's another kind of um, prompt or, or a response at, uh, in a motivation for them to, to, to construct a sentence where we give them a bar or a chart. Here we're asking them to do some thinking, some uh, absorbing of the information that's there graphically represented in order to construct uh, the kind of answer they want. And then they're given, again, they're given a vocabulary, a small vocabulary and asked to write a sentence. Um, in the lower right, we have a slightly different formulation of a response that's on yes, no, or uh, question, answer kind of pairs. Um, let me show you one example here where uh, we ask the student to write a response. Um, uh, in this case, the first sentence in a paragraph. This is in a, in a sequence where we're scaffolding up the uh, ability to construct um, a paragraph with a beginning sentence, a concluding sentence, and uh, some supporting sentences in the middle. Here we're just asking them to practice by writing a sentence in that paragraph. We've given them some small vocabulary and they write, uh, the child starts out by saying, I won an awesome game. Well, they made a solid grammatical mistake there. We want them to perfect that. We want them to recognize that uh, they need to use an article singular count nouns like game in this case. So we give them that red box, that feedback triggered by this um, error and uh, gives them fairly precise instructions on how they should fix that, that sentence in order to make it grammatically well-formed. And then move on to uh, the next step in that paragraph construction process. Um, the kinds of errors we're looking for, there are about 110 just error types that we currently accommodate through the application of this relatively large implemented grammar of English that I've been working on for so many years. And I'm now uh, we're now applying in this in this curriculum, um, and so I can detect um, when there are missing prepositions, extra prepositions, where there's a subject or an object missing, where the answer is a fragment, where there's run-on sentences. You can run down this this list of uh, the first 15 or 20 or so of these error types. Look at, and you see some dollar x um, variables in those patterns. There are places where, for the particular student, our machine will find the word or word that indicate the location of the error. So for example, in that sentence, in that error message, you're missing the word two after the word dollar X. We would insert into our message to the individual student, the word of their sentence where they made a mistake. So we're trying to be as precise as possible in both what the mistake was and where the, where the repair should happen. We are not at this point in the student, the corrected sentence. We could also do that. That's essentially a, a design decision, a teaching philosophy decision. In this instance, we're working hard to give the student the right information tools to make the repair, but inviting the student to actually do that repair rather than doing it ourselves. So we have um, made, um, because we started this process in, uh, at Stanford in a carefully controlled um, a study, for um, a rather large number of students. Ran this uh, curriculum, the, kind of the, the course, as I've designed it to you, a slightly earlier version of that, course, but with all of the components I described, with a set of about 5,000 students in the city of Memphis, Tennessee. We ran that over a two-year period, measuring, um, on the one hand, what the student's state exam for was before and after each year, beginning and the end of each of these years, over the two-year period, and also keeping careful track of both how much time the students within our course using the software, practicing the writing skills, do reading, doing the exercises, doing the multiple choice. And we measured um, effectively the amount of positive work the students did. So a student who was just clicking buttons on the screen for 15, 20 minutes a day wasn't making very much progress. They were doing random, random behavior. They didn't do much we were calling positive work. The student who was answering more of the questions, doing more of the exercises successfully than not, was doing positive work. And you can see that um, in general, in those green boxes, there's one in the one corner we see, what was the delta in that student's test score, that upper left score, uh, based on the year before? How much did they improve or drop in their overall score in language arts and writing 
Um, and in the lower right, or in, in the column on the left, there's a measure of how much work were they doing. So typically, there was a very nice uniform connection between the more work the students did, um, the, the, the more of an improvement they made in their test score. But there is another scoring uh, a measure across the bottom of that box, which says, what was that actual test score? So a student who was suffering, was doing worse, was working below grade level, um, uh, showed for us the most opportunity for improvement. The, two, the one or two years of work they did with our course gave them a more dramatic improvement than students who were actually already doing pretty well in language arts and writing. Those students who were um, at or above grade level also benefited from the use of the course, but their benefit was a little bit less than that of the students who were suffering or struggling with this material beforehand. So um, some we could show from this rather large scale study over a two year period that the student used the course, um, worked with the software, tried to learn from what we instructed uh, in the resources we gave in this immediate feedback, showed measurable and significant improvements in their state exam scores, this external measure of how well they were doing in, in mastering the technology, the skills needed for language arts and writing. There's one more element I want to touch on here before we, uh, before I hand this back to uh, to um, the, the There is an element of this course which goes right back to that 50 year ago effort that Patrick Soupy's, and that's this notion of um, adaptive motion, of having proficiency be measured by the machine, by the computer, based on a pattern of correct and incorrect answers, and then saying, What's the likelihood that the, students, uh, uh, the student is going to do well on their next attempt? That's a measure of their level of proficiency. Have they got the hang of this particular concept? And are we ready to move on to the next one? Do we spend more time practicing here? And when that probability of the next answer being right, because the student has done the previous three or four exercises correctly, then we say, no real point in getting the student busy with this particular practice activity. Let's use their time wisely and move to another topic and another concept. In contrast, a student who is randomly messing around, getting one right, one wrong, one right, one wrong, that red, um, uh, uh, green pattern um, in the case of student A, that student hasn't yet demonstrated mastery. They're getting a fair number of right answers, but they're getting wrong answers in a pattern which suggests they don't really yet understand what's going on here. They're making some lucky guesses or getting some things right, but they need practice. That student A, we're going to give them more opportunities to continue work with this particular concept before moving forward. Whereas the student B, who has, after having a little bit of a rocky start, gets a hold of the material and clearly knows what's going on, the machine will, I think, rightly in this case say, we're ready to move forward. That notion of activity at this very fine grain level, where we have an expectation of what the student can do and can't do, what their efficiency level is, that gives us a highly reliable measure of where the machine should take the student next. The machine is doing most of the driving here. There's a range of possible moves, a range of next steps that the machine can invite the student to work on, and that decision is based on the pattern of the student's previous and current behavior. So we have an activation-driven and, and um, uh, experience-driven strategy. Um, this is implemented in a relatively interesting algorithm that is um, also contained in the language arts and writing course, like it is for the Redbird Mathics course, which is also built on the same core conception of uh, ad adaptivity uh, for the machine based on student performance. I can move to that slide. Uh, um, the the, the um, observation that Janet made a little bit earlier, which is that uh, it's important machine to be confident in its responses to the student when it's making a response, whether something is correct or incorrect. That's relatively straightforward for most of the mathematics that we're trying to teach um, in the math course. In language arts, as you as of the topic of the subject of the discipline already know, there are places where that can be blurry and certainly places where that can be difficult for a machine to ascertain. And so in the design of our course and the, and the, the technology, this evaluation technology, we have been focusing on finding the right sweet spot, the right balance, where when we tell us that there's a mistake, there is an overwhelmingly high probability that that student actually did make that. Um, we are currently aiming at roughly 
one error or less in a hundred responses to the machine. Now you might complain that we're seeing one mistake in every hundred sentences that a student writes. Um, uh, no, it's perfect. Even our machine isn't perfect. We find that to be an acceptable level of error of noise that's introduced. Students can be robust. Um, the the um, the alternative um, that if we make is when a student makes a mistake. Sometimes we will look at that. The machine will look at that and say, "Probably a mistake. Pretty sure it is, but I'm not sure enough." And so I will decline to criticize the student for that error. Let's assume that in the larger picture, I'm going to see, see the student make those mistakes. Let's, uh, let's try and um, uh, move on and give them more chances to write. So we are always looking at the data we've collected. We've collected so far around 10 million sentences of students who have been using versions course before. Um, and uh, we want to continue to learn from that growing corpus uh, to decide how best we can tune the system. We're also, also, of course, looking for additional error types in order to do this. Now, stepping one step in this final uh, slide, we are looking for ways to give the students more opportunities to write and to get feedback, even though we know that, that you teachers have many of the things to do and can't take the time and can't physically give responses to 30 students all at the same time if they're all busy writing on a task. Um, you can give uh, answers to some of you are superhuman and can do that uh, usefully across the classroom a little bit. But what we think is needed for these to practice writing uh, is that they write a lot. And in order for them to write, we're pretty sure evidence shows, research shows, they do better if they're getting feedback, if they're getting a sense that someone is listening to their attempts and giving them some counts about how they could do it better and do it differently. And the machine is capable of doing that at scale with uh, thousands, tens of thousands of students all at the same time. With enough set up on the network, we can cope with that large volume and we can give the student immediate feedback within a second or two. We can tell them, here's what you wrote, here's how we think it could be improved, these are the mistakes that you make, um, have made, let's, let's try it again and give it a chance to, in that instant, try to make the repair and confirm that it was made or uh, suggest some further work to do. So that uh, overlying, overarching goal we have is to use this technology to have those students, to the students to do more writing. We're certain that they learn to write by writing. Uh, that, that's clear, uh, it's my own experience. And uh, we think, we hope, we believe that by uh, giving them that immediate feedback, we provide enough incentive so that they will cheerfully continue to practice and improve that craft writing, that set of skills, even though um, the machine is not going to be of that student feedback on whether the, uh, the uh, piece of art that they constructed was beautiful or was amusing or was even truthful. The machine has a very hard time making those kinds of evaluations. So uh, the, the higher level elements uh, that need to be judged and the student need back on, those will have to come from you, the teachers. But we hope we can find a better distribution, better balance of, of effort, labor and time where the teacher can focus on this higher level tasks, which are also rather more quickly available to the teacher, um, can be given in smaller doses and at a coarser granularity. You can let the machine take care of tuning and fine-tuning and practicing those more fine-grained mechanics and, and grammatical issues that the student needs to practice on. Okay, so um, I think we're um, finished with this part of it. Uh, I think we're now ready to move to um, a um, set of questions, and I know that some of you have been writing some questions, uh, and I'll um, uh, invite uh, Meg now to uh, help us um, uh, work through this question and answer session. Okay. Thank you, Dan, Dan and Janet, both of you so much. Um, I really, really appreciate both of your, um, your teachings from today. So we've been getting some great questions in for both Dan and Janet. Um, we'll start with some of Dan's since uh, some of these were most recent and they're at top of mind right now. So Dan, the first question for you is, does the program correct skills that haven't yet been taught to students? Um, I, 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 in one sense, yes. 
So uh, the, the, the curriculum that is built into Langman writing is faithful to uh, uh, a, a standard um, designs and setups and sequencing um, as state, uh, state standards uh, and the common core. Um, and so you won't be entirely astonished at the order in which these concepts and elements are presented. But because this course is individually added to the students' um, speed of learning, student who's doing really well and moving quickly is very soon going to uh, move ahead of where the classroom might be instructing. And so the student will have seen that middle that they're being given responses to, that they're being critiqued on. They will have seen that through the course, but may not have necessarily in the classroom. Likewise, a student who is maybe a grade level behind may have long forgotten what you, the teacher, taught them or the previous teacher of the year before, but they will have seen that material again, supplementally reminded uh, of in, in our course, they will have had it relatively fresh in their mind. So yes, the skills that we um, evaluate on and respond to are a part of the course and are governed by the order and the, the pace of presentation of the course, but you should expect there's gonna be that potential misalignment with what's happening in your particular classroom. Thank you, Dan. Um, okay, another one for Dan. Can you tell us more about the research behind the importance of immediate feedback in improving student writing? Did I say talk, tell us more about the research? I hope I read that correctly. Can you tell us more about the research behind the importance of yeah. immediate feedback in improving student writing? <laughs> Um, uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to take the time now to cite for you um, chapter and verse. I'm not even sure I can do that, uh, act, uh, but we can we can do that maybe as an offline follow up for this uh, for this particular webinar. Uh, the 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 broad um, uh, lessons that we have learned from the research we've studied are that uh, students um, simply are given a blank piece of paper and said, "Go away and write for a while." Uh, and if there is any feedback to that response, if there's no feedback at all, um, very few students will have the internal motivation to continue to fill up that page with uh, text. They are surely not going to be able to teach themselves, based on the mistakes that they've made, how they can do better the next time. So if they make a systematic set of mistakes, like they continue to write, um, me and John went to the store, and then me and him um, uh, bought some candy, and then um, uh, we went to the beach, that that misuse in prescriptive grammar of that coordination of the accusative pronoun and the coordinate structure, if they mistake once and nobody says anything differently, they're going to keep doing it. The, the immediate feedback is a chance for the student to say, oh, there's something you didn't like. I will try to change my behavior, and then you tell me whether you like the change that I made better or not. That, that immediacy is part of the standard assumption we have, and the research supports this, that a student needs to know what to change, try the change, and then uh, be able to be confirmed in the correctness of the change or be told, yeah, you're getting closer, but that's still not right. Let's try again. Let's move on to another set of practice sessions. So um, there's a, there, there, in one sense, it's a kind of common sense view that we need the feedback and it needs to be accurate and uh, immediate. Um, you might argue uh, as a as a counter um, position, no, no, it's enough for me to have the student do an exercise. And when I get a chance on the weekend to red pencil that essay they wrote, um, I'll give it back to them a week later and they will serve. I don't deny that that's a way of learning. That's how I went through grade school. I did not have instantaneous feedback and I was interested in the writing task and was able to apply useful lessons for learning to make those mistakes. But that one week turnaround, meant there was a week in which I was getting no feedback at all. I wasn't doing anything. I might be doing more writing, but I wasn't getting any feedback. So it's not only the immediacy, but the fact that I can give steady stream of feedback. I can just get more volume into the game. I can give the student more time to respond because of this core assumption that we're making, which I believe the, the research supports, that a student needs to motivate it in order to do writing, in order to change their behavior. So it's, I admit, not the sharpest argument I could make um, to say um, immediate feedback, sir, because in fact, there isn't very much available evidence outside of the kind of course we're building that does that except at a very small scale. But we've been working with tens of thousands of students and seeing that they can improve their test scores by doing this work. And what's distinctive about the program, the medicine we're introducing is this immediacy and this adaptive 
response to what they've done. So there is, in some sense, an experience-based argument, uh, the research done ourselves, that makes that, uh, makes that a, a potentially convincing position. And I'd like to add um, another piece of research that I've been reading. I'm not going to be able to quote it off the top of my head, but the summary of it is that when students are at that point where they, they are grappling or struggling or know that they've gone something wrong, that is the richest part. That's when they're most ready for instruction. So giving them feedback right then is feedback that they'll pay attention to because they've known, they know that something's wrong, their brain is firing, and getting that, they're most ready to accept that input and to grow and, and learn from it right at that point. So there is research that, that shows that. It's more general research than the research that Dan has been doing in the program. But um, we've been applying that to Redward Math and some other places as well. Okay, terrific. Um, Janet, I'm going to pose this next question to you. Students are getting many writing prompts within the program, but what if they don't like them? Can they keep requesting a different prompt until they like one or find one that really taps into their own schema? Man, wouldn't that be great? Uh, no, we, right now the students have, have the prompts that are within the program. If they grapple with one, they will get additional ones that are, are in a similar format, a similar structure, so they can practice the same thing with a different, a different uh, prompt, but they can't just say, no, I don't like that prompt, I don't like that prompt, I don't like that prompt. You know, I've never been to a beach. I don't want to answer a question about a beach. Um, we're not there yet. Um, it would require a ton of additional items, but um, that's a great idea for the future. All right. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, um, you'll tell me if I'm talking about this. Let me just uh, one point. There is a there is a piece of there's a piece of work doing for um, a relatively near to addition of course where we are going to give the student a little more control outside of the, the kind of a mechanic curriculum of each concept being taught in a particular order. We're going to have some cumulative opportunity for the students to do what we're calling something like a writing project or a larger task. And there we give the student more of that freedom. We give them a range of topics that they can write about and allow them to make some selection. So we are in the relatively near future going to at least incorporate some element of that ability for the student to have a little control over their destiny uh, in what they're asked to write about. Uh, that'll be, uh, it's a it's a near soon come traction. Uh, so, Janet so says I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> no, well, we don't, we don't usually announce um, new features so far in advance of having them ready, but, um, but you guys get to hear it and, and there's no harm. Mm -hmm. All okay, right. Thanks. Um, so the so danger I'm of putting your researcher onto the page. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this next question, I'm going to have um, Dan start, and then Janet, if you'd like to elaborate, you may have some additional things to add. Um, so Dan, what grade levels did your research specifically apply to? But then um, I would actually like to extend that to say, what actual grade level of student would a program like Redbird Language Arts and Writing really be effective for? Um, yeah, it's nearly the same answer for both. Uh, we were doing the study. We had a we had course material, instruction material for students who, if they were working at grade level, had been in grades two through five. So we had, uh, a, 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 but of course, students working uh, often a grade or two below grade level or sometimes a grade or two above grade level. Um, but these are the young elementary school students. We started at grade two because we wanted that writing component to be front and center part of the course from the minute that they sat down to work with us. And for kindergarten and first grade students, there's too much of an task in getting vocabulary, figuring out phonetics, figuring out the coding scheme to write. And so we, at that point, elected and still have elected not to try to do this style, this focused uh, writing-centered course for those youngest students in, in the primary school. Um, we have since then added material for grade six and seven. And so now there is uh, material for both. And to present this course as one which is really focused on the range of students uh, who at grade level would be in grades two through six so that we have some material to work with those students who are maybe even at grade, at grade level in grade six, but moving a little ahead of their of their time at grade seven. I, I think in addition, um, students, some students who are, are older, who are in uh, middle school or even high school, who are really grappling with writing, um, 
writing issues and maybe haven't learned um, some grammar that we can use to discuss their writing um, might benefit from doing this. I would also add that one of the initial uses of the program was with gifted and talented students. Um, and we had, have had younger students use it who were prepared to work at the second grade level. Um, and particularly if they have the keyboarding and technology skills mm -hmm. needed. Um, younger kids who need additional challenge that um, can't be provided um, in their whole, whole group situations, um, this might be good for those students as well. Um, agree, Dan? Yeah. yeah, agreed. Um, I'm going to say Janet, but I might be wrong with who might be best able to answer this question. So you guys are going to keep me on my toes. Um, a question that just came in is, does the program give kids models oh. to peruse before they dive into some of the deeper writing, um, particularly uh, paragraph models? Let's have Dan take that one. Um, yeah, let me, let me, yeah, thanks, Jen. Let me answer that. Uh, yes, the, there, are, there are a couple of ways in which we do that modeling. Um, one strand that goes right through the course is that in addition to having this write individual sentences, those were all the examples that I showed you in the, in the slides. Also, um, at certain points in each grade, ask the students to craft a paragraph where they are given a, uh, essentially a blank square um, a tangle and a set of about 100 vocabulary items and asked to construct a paragraph. They don't do that and have helped given them practice at writing the first sentence and last sentence and middle sentences. And we do that a couple of times. We eventually give them a blank easel and ask them to paint artwork for us to create that structure. But they have seen along the way parts of each of those paragraphs that were written for them, models of how a good paragraph ought to look into which they're inserting one of their sentences. That's one kind of modeling, which is maybe more directly connected to writing task. But at the same time, throughout the course, I mentioned rather in passing that we include a reading component in the course. The student is given models of excellent writing, uh, both fiction and nonfiction, uh, uh, ordinary prose, um, some with dialogue, a variety of styles of writing, um, all high quality, all part of standard approved canon of things that students should learn to read. And along the way, we are identifying elements of those passages that the student should attend to in order to connect that to the writing that they're supposed to be doing, that they're, that they're learning. And so they see that um, sort of case professional writing, which is maybe some distance from what we're really going to expect them to produce themselves. That gives them something to aspire to. And we're giving them examples of paragraphs very much like the ones we hope they will write. And those are closer to the mark, closer to grade level, um, and also serve as good models they should try to do. And, and since Dan's already mentioned it, we are also in development on, a, on um, larger, larger uh, writing uh, pieces that students will have to do, and, and there also they will have some models. So more to come. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, um, this question is for Dan, and it goes back to um, the case study that you talked about that occurred in Shelby County. Um, so uh, there was a question that came in about a control group. Was there a con yeah. control group in that Shelby County study? And tell us more about that. Yes, that was a, it's a perfectly good question. It was the question that the reviewers of the article that we submitted for publication in uh, Language and Computation, this national journal, um, they objected to our uh, initial version of article because we said, look, we were working with all of the things that were available in the entire county. We didn't have room for a control group. We were able to set that up. And anyway, the notion of a like for like, when I have 5,000 students in this, is not practical. Um, instead, we turn to mathematics and statistics. And because Pat Supis, my the lead for that study, is a superb mathematician and statistician, he said, let me teach you, reviewers of this article, how statistics works and how uh, um, the, there is a measure of standard deviation um, and about the likelihood that these students could have improved their score in a random way um, in the numbers we're showing you. Um, the, the, the application of those standard mathematical models for statistics we were able to, to show to convince viewers were in fact at least as valid 
as a control group, because if we'd had a control group on that scale, we would have had to do some very careful alignment to say, we have factored out every issue about income and uh, parental support and this level of the neighbor's music box next door and every other possible reason that confounded two students who we claim were alike and one of them did better than the other. So um, it's a long answer to say, in this kind of a study, at the scale and the complexity we were conducting, a control group isn't really a practical thing. It's great for 20 or 50 or maybe even 100, not practical for 5,000 students. But that does say, I don't back off for a minute from the validity, the statistical scientific validity of the results that we showed you. They are astonishingly strong in their, in their significance, the statistical significance of these measures. Those students were gaining 20 and 30 points uh, in their score, their test exam from one year to the next in a district where the tendency was for the students to drop farther and farther below grade level. So none of the teachers that we showed the results to had any doubt, um, uh, even before we tried to teach them about statistics, that these were profoundly in findings. This is a very clear measure. But um, I do have to concede that this is the kind of a study where that traditional scientific notion of a control group simply just can't apply. It's not the right tool for this kind of test. Thank you. All right, we're going to take one final question and then um, uh, and then close things up. We want to be really respectful of, of your time today. If there are any additional questions that even if we're as we're answering this final question or as we're wrapping things up that you come to mind, please continue to enter them into the Q&A or into the chat box and we will make sure to follow up with them in the um, answer them in the follow up email that everyone will receive um, following today's webinar. So the final question that, um, that I want to talk about is a question came in about, is this program Redbird language arts and writing embedded within the language arts program that McGraw Hill offers? Um, and I'm going to make an assumption by saying that, um, this person is probably, uh, probably thinking of our core reading programs or our core language arts programs. Um, so Janet had actually already responded, responded in the chat that the program is aligned to um, the same set of standards that most core uh, reading and language arts programs are aligned today, but it's not currently, um, it's not embedded within those programs. Yes, there are packages where you can purchase both, but I think really what this question gets at is really talking about how to most effectively use a program like Redbird Language Arts and Writing in conjunction with core any any core reading program that you might be using, whether it's a McGraw Hill program or any core reading program. Um, so Janet, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you field that one, and then we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Okay, so. <clears throat> One of the interesting things is that a core reading, a core language arts program usually moves students uh, forward in, in probably mostly together. Um, there may be some places where you can do some differentiation, but mostly students, you have a goal for all your students and they're all working out together. Um, the issue with that is what I talked about initially in this presentation, which is that zone of proximal development and how having everyone working at the same thing at the same time um, may not serve all students very well. So, um, so what, what um, language arts and writing, Redbird language arts and writing allows you to do is to um, address writing and grammar skills in particular for students wherever they're ready to learn and let them move as slowly um, or as quickly as they need to to stay in that zone of proximal development. So, um, and then I talked about those different uh, classroom organization models that give you time to allow students to do that. Sometimes people will be um, worried that have, that that if the computer uh, the, the computer experience doesn't match what's going on in the classroom, that students will be confused. And and we really don't find that students are pretty able to compartmentalize and to um, address what they're learning at the time that they're learning it. Okay, so I think we'll move on to the next slide, which is just a quick wrap up. And Janet, I'll let you start off. Cool. Um, so <clears throat> these are the things that we did today. Um, how how can um, we, we first talked about? I talked about how educators can improve statistics, and we talked about um, improving student writing proficiency by making the learning experience more personalized and the feedback more immediate. Then Dan. 
Yeah, uh, the the research that I described was actually in two parts. The more specific concrete research was the work that we did ourselves in building out uh, this system with an evaluation of student writing errors and immediate response to those errors, and then measuring the efficacy, the effectiveness, the usefulness of that approach in uh, learning outcomes uh, on a large the student population in Shelby County. Um, and then the second part of the research, which I was did not give you a specific chapter and verse on, is uh, in uh, supports this notion of the value of immediate feedback, but is also appealing to your common sense in supporting and being congruent with those re research outcomes, which is that as students get more practice at writing, they become better writers. If they get accurate and, and, and quick feedback, which motivates to make adjustments and continue doing that practice in writing. And then finally, we had an amazing session of question and answer with both Dan and Janet. Some wonderful questions came in. Um, some great questions about just some more thorough understanding of the research, how to really effectively fit personalized learning and programs like Redbird Language Arts and Writing into a regular ELA routine. Um, and we've been continuing to get some more questions in the chat box, and I wish we had time for all of them today. We will definitely be sure to, um, to answer all of those, as I said, in the follow-up email. Um, so, in conclusion, I just want to thank Dan and Janet so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. Thank you, thank you. And a huge thank you to our audience for taking time out of your busy schedules to spend some time with us today. We hope you are taking away some valuable nuggets that you can apply immediately to your classrooms. And we really hope you'll join us for our next professional learning webinar that will be coming up in May. So keep an eye out for an invitation on that. Um, also, be sure to keep an eye out for that follow-up email. We'll provide a recording of today's presentation. We'll address any questions we may not have been able to answer live. Um, and if you would like to learn a little bit more about the solution we talked about today, Redbird Language Arts and Writing, you can go to redbirdlearning.com. That's redbirdlearning, one word, dot com. Um, it's a nice, uh, you'll get, you'll get a, a, there's a really thorough section on the research that Dan explained today, some of the efficacy. Thank you for Janet um, for typing that into the message. That's the, the website name that you can go to to learn more about that program. Yes, there's a student demo that'll really nicely walk you through the program. There's some grade level activities so you can check out um, some of the various intro, uh, the, the instruction, practice, application, that immediate feedback um, response tool on, on uh, student writing. And um, thank you again. We hope you have a great day.